music. Everyone can get up on their feet as we worship the Lord today. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. It looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. And fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Fear you won't define me, cause that's what my father does. Ooh, lay our burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check the shame.
See you next. g 
You know, church family, as we sing that song and we reflect on the goodness of God, I can't help but take my problems off of myself, off of my surroundings, off of my situation, and back onto who He is. You know, I got this picture in first service, I'll share it with you, but a picture of little thought bubbles like around this room right now above everybody's head. And what those thought bubbles might represent are things that are just weighing on your mind, situations that are weighing on you, things that are upcoming in this week or this day, or just problems or relationships. And it's just like this sense of everybody's walking through something different. But the one thing that we can focus on in this house today is that he is sovereign. He is good. He is who he says he is. He's still on the throne. He still holds all authority and all power over your circumstance, your situation, that you still have the victory because you are seated at the right hand of God. And that is your authority that you carry. And so could we just go into today with a sense of awe, a sense of awe as to who he is, God, we thank you that you are chasing us down, Lord. It's not the other way around. You're not some far off God and we are running after you. No, no, Lord, you are running after us. You're not far away. You're a a step away, God. All we need to do is turn, Lord, and receive what you have for us. How many years do we waste, God, giving you our backs? But we all had a moment, God, where we decided or when we will decide to turn, Lord, and embrace you. I pray that that would be this moment right now, that we would hear what you have to say to us, that we wouldn't have our backs towards you. We thank you that we don't got to go through all these steps to get to you, God, that you're there waiting with arms stretched open wide. So Father, would you remind us of your sovereignty and for those whose mind are fixed on you, you will keep in perfect peace. So would you burst those thought bubbles today, God, with just a fresh sense of awe as to who you are, your lordship, in our lives. God, we love you. We commit this time to you, God. We expect a word from you. We expect an encounter by the Spirit of God, the living word himself. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for his presence. In your precious name we pray. Amen and amen. Guys, when you come to church, what you're saying is, I'm making myself available for the Holy Spirit to move in me. We're so grateful you're here. As you take a seat, would you give someone a high five and let them know you're grateful that they're here with you today? Oh, good morning, Mosaic family. How are you today? Welcome back. This is our second service of the uh, morning. 1030. If you have children, um, if it's your first time here, I'll just let you know. If you have children or you ha- want to invite someone that has uh, kids, our first service at 9 o'clock is where we have our kids ministry. Dr. Angela Walter just loves to just uh, jump around with those kids in there and t- teach them about Jesus and all that he's done in their, in their lives. So uh, that's the time to do it. But this is our second service here at 1030. So welcome, welcome. First off, I want to get into life groups. All right, so who is a part of a life group? We're so glad that you could be a part of these life groups with us. Uh, For those of you who don't know, it's up here on the screen. We have a men's group, a women's group, a young adult group, and a teen group. Uh, We just started last week, actually, for our teen, or for our young adult group, I'm sorry. They're going to start right after this service today, actually, and... uh, Trevor Woolwine back here is going to be teaching an awesome class on that, so look forward to that. But uh, yeah, go ahead, take a picture of it. So uh, for men, Saturday morning, 7.30, I know it's a little early, but we love to meet, and every third uh, Saturday, we like to go out for a little breakfast. It's it's just a great time. Uh, I'm sure you've heard, iron sharpens iron, right? And so men of God come together. It's a great time. Uh, Our women's groups, Tuesday evening, 6.30 to 8 p.m., and then our teen group, I actually... uh, I'm honored to teach that with Dr. Angela Walter. Uh, we teach that on Wednesday evening, 6.30 to 8. So if you have any teens, ages 13 to 18, and they want to, they have nothing to do on a Wednesday night, bring them out. And I, we'd love to just, we have pizza and donuts and cookies and soda, and we love to just talk about, uh, to talk about God. So more than welcome for that. Uh, This is our uh, last week uh, in the uh, Building Healthy Relationships series. So starting next Sunday, we're going to be doing the Life of Jesus series. So give it up for that. That's going to be a big big new series. That's going to be six weeks long leading all the way up to Easter. Who can believe that we're six weeks away from Easter already? It's crazy to think about. This year is flying by. 
But uh, yeah, that's, that's something to look forward to, our upcoming uh, series there. Uh, our welcome party, March 5th, all right? So this is going to be an afternoon event. Basically, anyone who's new to our church um, within, you know, the past eight months or so, I say that because I was new eight months ago, and I never got my welcome party, so I'll be a part of that. As they'll be welcoming me there as well, but we're going to just have a great time together. Uh, this is our last day to sign up for this, so if you want to sign up for this, if you haven't already, the QR code on the front of the seat, uh, on the back of the seat in front of you, uh, just scan that, and you can register for that uh, in our events page. Also, we have our worship nights again coming up, uh, I, I want to say two, two weeks from now. The uh, March 9th, second Thursday of each month. So if you haven't been a part of our worship nights before, it's just a great time. Um, at 7 o'clock, we just come together right here, and we just worship God, lay our problems, our burdens throughout the week, and we just give it to God, and it's just so refreshing. So if you haven't been a part of that, feel free to stop by 7 p.m., uh, March 9th. Uh, if you have any further questions at this time, uh, the email uh, right here, Pastor Sarah's email, you can... Uh, speak with her directly on the email or visit the second time booth after this service. I will be out there. If you have any questions, I can help you out with, with whatever you need. So uh, at this time, we'd love to connect with you. So there's connect cards in front of you, uh, in the seat in front of you. If you want to fill one of those out, whether you're a first time guest, a second time guest, or a regular attendee, uh, we'd love to have your feedback on how we're doing as a church and that. If you uh, are more digitally inclined, you can take a uh, scan the QR code there and uh, just log it right in to our website there. Um, for first-time guests, we have uh, out here in the first-time booth after service, stop by. We have a little gift for you, welcoming you to, to our church. And, uh, and anyone who's second time, their second time here, stop by the second-time booth, and I will give you a mission statement T-shirt. It's a pretty cool T-shirt uh, you get to wear. Um, and, you know, again, that's another place where you can connect any of the outside events that we have coming up. You can stop by there. We can talk about that. Um, at this time, we're going to prepare for tithe and offering. Uh, just real quick, uh, we, we do two things for tithe uh, online uh, through Tithely app. You can uh, give your tithe on there. We also uh, will have the basket going around here. And then there's also right outside the doors here, we have the drop box if you want to do that as well. So at this time, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, us coming together this morning. Thank you for the freedom that we have to just join together on a Sunday morning. We just pray right now that you would bless this offering we're about to receive. Let it benefit your kingdom, God, and to further, further your glory, God. We thank you so much. Amen.
on, church family. Let's just celebrate who God is one more time as we prepare and get in his word. All right, friends, if you have noticed, it is the last Sunday of the month, which is Mission Sunday here at Mosaic Church. And so at the end of service, we will have an opportunity to have a special offering, a special collections. It's our sacrificial giving as a church family towards our mission partners of this year. And I'm excited to tell you that I'm in contact with our missionary couple that we are supporting, and they are going to be out this spring to uh, share a word with us and to let us know how God is moving over in the Middle East, like how wide is that just thank you for your faithfulness and journeying with us in this year of sacrificial giving all right guys we are ending our building healthy relationships series let's celebrate we're celebrating church here okay if you look at the word mosaic that last letter c stands for celebrate they each represent a value of ours and we believe in celebrating and uh, you'll learn more about our values at our welcome party next sunday so this coming sunday or this next sunday not today 5 p.m. here at the church in the growth track room, we have a welcome party. If you've never attended a welcome party, take your phone out right now. I'll give you permission to be on your phone in church. Hover it over that QR code. Select welcome party. It'll send me a memo, and I'll add you to the group, and you'll get the update. But, hey, there's going to be dinner. We'll talk about our mission, our vision, our values. You'll learn about how you can be a part of what God is doing in and through Mosaic Church. And So today's your last day to register because we got to prepare for you guys. we got to have food for you. Okay, I'm not having you come and not having a meal for you, so make sure you let us know if you're bringing someone along. If uh, you're brand new to the church and today's your first day, sign up. It's our best way of connecting with you. We have extra time together. You get to meet part of the team. Uh, some share their stories a little bit of how the church has impacted them, and I love it. I love those times together, and so that'll be super special. If launch, uh, Life Group's just launched. Hello. Come on. It's spring. It's spring, Barb. It was 60 degrees out this past week, and I know it's a little chillier this weekend, uh, but hey, we are in our spring life groups. It's not too late to jump in. If you feel like, oh, man, I missed the start date this past week, listen, jump in right now. Stop at the Second Time booth. We'll help hook you up with our Church Center app where you can get the messages and the updates and the meeting times and all that good stuff. If you're a young adult, stay after second service. We got food for y'all and a, a, a great time of fellowship and a strong word. So we are going to jump in because I've been telling the team that I got a lot to give you today. If you're ready for the journey, say, I'm ready for the journey. If you're not ready for the journey, I'm telling you, you better get on board right now because we are going on a journey in this half hour that we have together. I'm telling you, God has some practical tools for us. If you were with us last week, I brought out this tiny little thing. If you weren't with us, don't worry. I'll give you a really short, nice little recap here. We said, what is this? And I brought it down because it's small, and you guys gave me a couple ideas. You said maybe it's to break chains. Maybe you could use it as a holder. Maybe you could do these things. And we said, look, if you try to do any of that with it, you'll probably hurt yourself or you might hurt somebody else. It's easy to break something if you don't understand the purpose behind it. If you don't understand why it was designed and how it's supposed to function, you can hurt it and it can hurt you. You can break it, and guess what? You'll never use it to its full potential. If I just tried to break chains with this, it probably would be ineffectual, and I couldn't really get the, the, the greatest possibility out of it. Now, if you do know what it is, it's a, it's a beautiful, tiny little device that helps sharpen tools for woodworking. So if any woodworkers in the house, probably not. However, if you were a woodworker, you would be able to tell me the purpose of this device. If you understand the purpose, you can then begin to use it. And quite like relationships, if you don't understand God's purpose, God's design for marriage, guess what? You can break it and it can break you. See, in this series, we've been learning that relationships can be such a beautiful source of healing and hope. If a parent walks into the back of a classroom, guess what? That atmosphere changes for that student. If you take a kindergartner, they're terrified. You put a parent in the back of that class, all of a sudden, that kid can breathe because someone they trust and they love can literally change the atmosphere. However, just as much as relationships can heal and bring hope, relationships can also break and be such a tremendous source of pain. Some of you in here may be holding an incredible amount of pain in your life because of bad relationships. 
failed relationships, hurt inflicted upon you by another person. And so God designed relationships for this beautiful purpose, and yet the enemy just takes the counterfeit of all things God, of all things good, and he uses it to break. We serve a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one God. We're made in his image. We're made to be relational. But relationships can build, but relationships can destroy depending on if you understand God's purpose behind it. That's why romantic comedies, romantic movies all end at the wedding because culture cannot tell you the purpose behind marriage. They don't understand the dream that God has for marriage to be a beautiful reflection of this sacrificial love in his church. And so if you don't understand that God's purpose for marriage is to make us holy, It's to be a display of Jesus, the bridegroom, and his church, the bride. A beautiful picture of sacrificial love. It's a picture of the cross to a world who is in desperate need of salvation. If you don't understand that, you'll go into it seeking happiness. When that fails, because it will fail, marriage cannot be a source of happiness. Joy comes from the Lord, and joy is its above circumstance. Happiness is based on happenings. And happenings change. Your spouse may go through something. You may go through something. You may need to heal from past trauma. That stuff may rise up in your life, maybe five years down the road, 10 years. And so my hope for you today is to give you some God-given principles to navigate your relationships well. We casted the vision. You got to know the purpose. You got to understand the design last week. But this week, we're going to take it down. We're going to make it bite-sized for us to say, what can I practically do to walk out my relationships well? Because this tool purpose is to sharpen tools for woodworking to mold. If you want to mold your relationships into something healthy, you need sharper tools. You've been trying to walk out your relationships with dull tools and you're not getting anywhere and you're frustrated, you're disappointed, and you're tired. But dull tools will never heal or mend or strengthen a relationship. You need the sharp tools. And who sharpens tools? The Holy Spirit is in the business of sharpening the tools that God has given us in our lives. And so we got to invite the Holy Spirit into the process of sharpening our tools. And so today that's what we're doing. I'm going to give you some God-given principles, things we can take from his word and how to apply it to our lives to navigate one of the most difficult parts of relationships, conflict. Today we're talking about conflict resolution. Today we're going there. We're going to talk about anger. We're going to talk about how do I manage conflict? How do I manage anger? Now, I'm telling you up front, I'm going to talk about this in a marital point of view. So I'm going to be talking about like a marriage, but all of these principles relate to any type of relationship, a mother-daughter relationship, a friendship relationship, uh, whatever conflict or strife that you are currently navigating in your relationships, these principles will apply. But I'm going to stay there just to stay on a common theme. Are you tracking? Say I'm tracking. All right, then we are going to go there today. Anger is inevitable. Now, today's anger is manageable. Tomorrow's is not. And what I mean by that is you can be angry today and you can navigate that. But if you carry today's anger into tomorrow and tomorrow's anger into the next day, that becomes unmanageable. Unresolved anger over time, unprocessed anger becomes a foothold. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. It gives you permission to be angry. Being angry in and of itself is not a sin. Now, anger can give birth to sin depending on how you choose to respond to it, but anger in and of itself is not a sin. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity foothold to Diablo, the devil, the slander. You go to bed on anger, it just gives the enemy permission to begin to slander that person to you. And now you're holding them accountable for future sins they haven't even yet committed. It says, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. See, long-term anger will steal from intimacy in your relationship. Long-term, unresolved anger will steal passion. It'll steal optimism. The Holy Spirit tells us not to harden our hearts. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 8 says, The Holy Spirit says, If you hear his voice today, don't harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing 
in the wilderness. So Holy Spirit, we just ask that we wouldn't harden our hearts against what you want to bring correction in us or in our relationships today, Lord. Let us have ears to hear and eyes to see what you have to speak to us today. Father, we receive what you have. We begin to unopen that gift right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Unresolved anger upon unresolved anger builds a cage around us, friends. When we begin to harden our hearts, it replaces the passion. Remember, intimacy, into me you see, invites vulnerability. So when you have intimacy in a relationship, into me you see there's vulnerability there. But unresolved anger upon unresolved anger builds walls in that relationship, and it builds a cage, and a cage that keeps people out, and it keeps you in. And so when you have hurt, what happens with hurt? It turns into anger. And what happens with anger? A cage begins to build. It gives a foothold to Diablo. It gives a foothold to the enemy to begin to rob you from the beauty of relationships. Unresolved anger not only impacts you and that relationship, but becomes a poor example to those around you. See, it's almost like we want people to follow us as we follow Christ. But if we don't know how to navigate anger well, what type of model are we to the next generation or to our kids? Consider your parents' conflict resolution style for a moment or lack thereof. Perhaps anger in your household has only ever been an explosive experience, and because you've never seen it done well, maybe you just avoid it entirely. And so because all you've ever witnessed was the slamming of doors and yelling and and raised voices, you've decided you're just not going to engage in conflict, and so you just leave. But anger upon anger just becomes unresolved and tends to grow into a greater problem. It doesn't go away just because we're not engaging it or acknowledging it. Or maybe you've never seen it. You've just seen passivity. And so you are kind of like a doormat. And so whatever comes your way, you just don't engage it because that's what you've seen. And it's just easier to avoid. It's easier to remain passive. And what I want us to know today is that unprocessed anger is dangerous. And if you've never had a good example in your life, it's okay because the Word of God is going to sit as our example today. And it's going to begin to cast new vision and give you new tools to begin to say, look, if I want to become a great soccer player, I got to go to practice. I got to study and I got to read. If I want to be a great artist, I got to study. I got to practice. I got to read. If I want to handle my anger different, if I want to handle conflict different, if I want to handle confrontation different, what do I got to do? I got to study and I got to read. We think that emotions just happen to us and our responses just happen. But see, the difference between a response and a reaction is this. A reaction is something unintentional. A response is a decision. And everyone in here has an opportunity to say, I'm going to choose to respond to my anger versus allowing it just to happen to me. Isn't that empowering to say, you know what, I never thought I had, I could control this area of my life, but God is going to give me tools by the Spirit of God to begin to walk this out in a new way. Has anyone ever gone on a shark excursion on vacation before? Yeah, me neither. Why would anyone do that? Apparently it's a thing, guys. It's a thing. Have you, Kate? I would love to. You would love to. Okay, we have few people who may, in fact, actually enjoy going on a shark excursion. We had one person in first service as well say they, they may enjoy that, but I'm telling you now, you're not going to find this girl on any boat trying to track sharks. But let me tell you something about a shark excursion. The crew draws the sharks to the boat by pouring in bloody fish into the water. Come on. Like, if there's blood in the water, you're going to see me out of the ocean. Like, just... <laughs> <laughs> I brought up first service. Angela here, we were in Puerto Rico. We were back in our teenage years, and some rumors started. Someone got a bloody nose, and there was water out in the deep blue sea. And uh, I may have translated it to her that there may be sharks because there's blood. And so this girl takes off. She was also on the swim team and, like, plows to the shore, except she was so terrified she didn't notice how close the shore was getting and swam right into the sand, face and all. Uh, (laughs) We don't let her live that one down. Although everyone says it's my fault, which I'm still to this day trying to figure out. If there are sharks, usually I'm swimming away. If there's blood in the water, you're going to find this girl out out of the water. These people, they purposely go to attract sharks. I don't know who would attempt to do that. A few of you, apparently. The sharks were immediately drawn to the blood, and I I need us to know today that this is how the enemy of our souls work. He doesn't say, oh, they're stressed out, so I'm going to leave their marriage alone, or oh, their children are struggling, so I'm just going to let their relationship intact. No, he sees uh, fatigue, he sees tension, and he uses that to get a foothold. 
And a foothold is like a door and an opening to begin to torment, create chaos, create confusion and fear and disunity and dissension. He sees fatigue, he sees tension, and he says, that's blood in the water, and that's, I'm going to use that, I'm going to come in that door. And a foothold left unattended, friends, becomes a stronghold, and he leaves chaos in his wake. And too often, because we let conflict happen to us versus saying, I'm going to respond and not react in this situation, we end up with con- uh, chaos in our wake. And so I want to talk to you about sharpening your tools to deal with inevitable conflict and anger so we're not giving a foothold to Diablos, to slander in our lives, which will, all left unattended, turns into a stronghold. Um, and again, I'm going to be speaking from a marital point of view, but this is going to be across the board in your relationships. I had a great, uh, there's a great premarital counselor and a great instructor of mine, and he said that when he starts pre-marriage counseling with a couple, or a couple comes in, they're seeking, you know, to officiate the wedding and go through premarital, he will say, tell me about your last fight. And for the couples who sit there and say, you know what, we just don't fight. Like, we've never had a fight. Like, that's just not, we're not fighters. Like, we just don't fight. He'll say then, you're not ready to get married. And he will not marry them. He says that you need to go live a little bit more life because what often happens is you're on your best foot or you're both avoiders. And, you know, that's not sustainable. Conflict will arise. We just have to decide how am I going to do conflict well. It's, it's like I'm planning for a soccer game. I want to plan to how do I do conflict well because conflict can move people to growth. Conflict can actually increase intimacy. If the idea of marriage is to become more holy, conflict brings out my impurity is to say, where do I need to grow and become more Christ-like? Where is my selfishness that I need to grow and become more Christ-like? And so conflict can actually move towards growth. Without conflict, people remain the same. And so conflict can actually sharpen each other. Instead of avoiding conflict and being fearful of conflict, because the world does conflict so poorly, what if instead we embraced conflict? What if we begin to say, what tools can I sharpen to do conflict well? So I'm going to give you two main things, two main categories that we're going to hit. One is awareness. Awareness around the actual experience of conflict. What is in fact going on? Because if you lack awareness in anything, it's harder to attack, right? It's harder to, to navigate if you don't know it's something's going to hit you up. It blindsides you. You don't know how to respond. So we're going to talk about awareness, what the actual experience of conflict entails. And then we're going to talk about strategies. What are some God-given tools to address it? God-given principles. And so here's, we're going to sit at the actual experience of conflict. When I'm arguing with someone, what is happening? What's even happening physically? What's happening emotionally? What's happening spiritually? Well, we know the enemy's trying to get a foothold. We know there's a third party in the room warring for, my uni- for our unity. My enemy is not, in fact, that person, but it's the enemy trying to create chaos in our relationship right now. But what's happening, f- happening physically? I want to talk to you about the term called flooding. Flooding is a physical response to conflict that you may experience during an argument. Your hormones and adrenaline triggers an increased pulse rate. Your blood pressure elevates. You begin to sweat. You have bodily signs of stress. Let me take it home for you. You're sitting on the sofa watching Netflix, okay? Your significant other comes through the door. They say, man, why'd you leave all these dishes in the sink? Now, you were just about to fall asleep, doze off to your favorite show, and now all of a sudden, how dare you bring up the dishes when the laundry has been unattended for three weeks, right? And so all of a sudden you went from dozing off to, you know, you're doing the thing, trying to get your back to stop sweating because like you're sweating profusely on the sofa now. And all of a sudden you have bodily signs of stress. You went from almost falling asleep to just that adrenaline, that fight or flight mode where you begin to go from your prefrontal cortex, which is your reasoning, your problem solving, to the back of your brain, which is your survival part of your brain, where the reasoning kind of shuts off, Barb, and the survival mode kind of kicks in. Now you're in this fight and this flight stance. And so a flooded person, the body's rash response makes rational thought almost impossible, and you get what's called tunnel vision. Tunnel vision is when your eyes and your ears are focused on potential warning signs and escape routes. So do you ever get stuck on something in an argument and you can't really move past it? Because your body's in a tunnel vision mode. 
your ability to listen, to problem solve, to understand someone else's emotions goes on hi hiatus. I remember when I'm offended or hurt getting in certain arguments and it being cyclical because I, could, I was stuck somewhere and I couldn't get beyond that. Can anybody relate to that experience? Okay, yeah, you're stuck here and it doesn't matter how much the person encourages or says, you are just, you need, you're just looking for evidence to back a certain truth that you're trying to hang on to. And so in those moments, there is a place for space to allow your body to regulate, to come back with clarity of thought. And so a flooded person may choose to confront an attack or refuse to listen or, um, and, and run. So that's your fight or your flight. I'm going to attack everything I have, all my forces, and I'm going to throw it at this one thing. Or I'm done. I'm shutting down. And any room for growth or hope, I'm just kind of shutting off to. Now, I want to talk to you about this idea of repairs. Um, Dr. John Gottman, in his book called The Love Lab, he has these like cool terms to kind of just categorize. I like category of thought. So he categorizes different experiences, and he makes you be able to get your hands around it kind of thing. And so repairs, he describes as the life jacket of a romantic situation. And so that's like when you're about to get into it with someone, but someone just gives you a, a light hand squeeze. Or maybe somebody says, kind of turns it into a joke. You ever, you're ever on the cusp of explosion, and then someone just throws in a little zinger or you know, just kind of puts their hand on you? What happens? It, it lowers your blood pressure and your heart rate. The tension level drops, and it allows reason to begin to prevail. So those are the little life jackets of your romantic <laughs> situation. They're called repairs. It's just that gentle sense of like reasoning again. Now, here's the problem. When you're in fight or flight mode, when you're flooded, those loving messages, those repairs get blocked because your body and your mind are in overdrive. And so your clarity of thought shuts off. Isn't that wild? Come on. I cannot be the only one relating to this narrative. So can somebody give me like a wave. I'm, a, I'm, li I'm, I'm with you, girl. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. And so some of you might have been really hard on yourself and you think, what is wrong with me that I'm exploding like that? What is wrong with me? I'm such a horrible person. I said I wasn't going to do that again. And then you, the enemy just comes in. He's like, well, I got her mad. She explodes. So now I'm just going to come in the other back door and be like, you suck as a person. <laughs> you know, and then it's just like brings on the guilt and the shame. He's like, I tempted you to freak out. And now I'm just going to point the finger and accuse you all day long. And now you're in just this self-pity mode. And so what I want to do today is just create some awareness to say you're not alone in your struggle. The Bible says that you have not been tempted, uh, that anyone else has also experienced as well. Like, you're not alone. This isn't unique to you. The enemy would try to make it unique to you to feel like your marriage is messier than anybody else's, or you lack hope in your relationship, or whatever it may be. And I want to tell you today that when this happens, that God has said through the Spirit of God, I have given you the fruit of self-control. And so often we, we're trying to do it all by ourselves, but one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. And so Matthew 26, 41 says, Watch and pray that you will not fall into temptation. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So maybe you're willing. In a good day, you're like, okay, I'm not going to do that again. Not, not going to freak out. <laughs> Anybody ever have that day? I'm, not, I'm just not going to do it again. And then you go there and you do it anyway. It says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So watch and pray. And that's what we're doing. We want to watch. We want to walk in self-awareness. Uh, we want to acknowledge the struggle. We want to put in some practical skills to say, okay, when I feel this way, this is what I'm going to do. This is my game plan. This is going to how I'm going to self-regulate. And I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit into that process. I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would empower me. That I'm not going to try to walk this truth out by myself. I'm going to be aware that this is what's going on. This is the dynamic. And now this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be proactive. So I'm going to watch. I'm going to walk in awareness. I'm going to, I'm going to I'll be more aware. When do I trip up? When do I notice? What triggers are going on? When am I most vulnerable? When does this explosion tend to happen? So I'm just going to watch. I'm going to acknowledge the struggle, and I'm going to invite the Holy Spirit into that process, and I'm going to ask God for help. Self-control being a fruit of the Spirit develops when you spend time with him. When you spend time with him and he begins to teach you about man, that's where that insecurity was coming from. You kept exploding on this person, but really it's because you keep trying to prove to yourself that you're worthy. You know, you keep battling them, but you're really battling yourself every time you engage in this because you're just trying to defend, 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 but really all you're trying to do is prove to yourself that you're enough. And so somebody can't even come to you with a healthy, hey, I need you to do this or that differently because you're so defensive anyway. You're so fearful you're not doing enough that you can't even receive that healthy feedback. And so it becomes this every single time. So we got to spend time with Jesus because Jesus will show those parts of our heart so we begin to work out of a secure identity, a secure self-worth in him versus out of trying to fill holes in our life by trying to meet God-sized needs in man-made ways. 
quick action step for you. Identify your limits and have a plan prepared. You know, how do I self-regulate? If you are, you know, a runner, you're like, that's me, Pastor, I'm out of there. Or if you are somebody who confronts and attacks, you got to kind of figure out, man, how do I tend to respond? How is God calling me to respond? And we're going to talk about some of those pieces in a minute. So make a plan. How do you, how do you, how do you chill? <laughs> I might, it may sound super simple, but when you're in a fight or flight mode, you don't really think, right? You don't have clarity of thought. So have a plan in place. Say, so, you know, I'm going to go on a walk and talk to Jesus. We're going to problem solve this in about an hour. We're going to plan a time tomorrow and readdress this. What is the game plan? What, what do I need to do? Do I need a playlist on Spotify or on Apple Music that says de-escalating? <laughs> be super obvious and lame about it. Or like my <laughs> time with Jesus. Like, I don't know. Be cutesy about it. Be lame. Be weird. I don't care. But just do something, right? Get yourself in the presence of God. Say, Lord, show me. And I guarantee you, if you meet with him, he will meet with you. Just like we sang in that song, like he's running after us. He is just waiting for us to turn. He's available. The problem is we're busy. We're busy little people. We're busy in our minds. We're busy in our thought. We're busy arguing, but we're never busy consulting the only one who could actually breathe life into something. The second thing we're going to talk about right now, we're going there, is strategies. God-given tools to address, address conflict, address anger. I'm going to give you in these strategies four common traps and arguments and then some practical biblical principles to navigate these four common traps. There are four negative modes of communication. Dr. Gottman calls them the four horsemen that wreak havoc in your life, and I completely agree. Number one is criticism. If you go into conflict, the tendency is to say you well, you didn't do this. You didn't pick up your phone. You didn't, you know, arrive on time. You didn't uh, finish the laundry. Whatever it may be, it's a you statement. You attacks character typically, right? It's not just like a you didn't do this. It's you are not enough. You are mean. There's a, there's a connotation behind the idea of you. And so a criticism is when you're attacking your spouse's character. And it often sounds like you always, it's a globalizing statement, or you don't care, meaning like you didn't do it on, like you basically did that on purpose. Like if you cared more, you wouldn't have done that. And so you statements kind of put people right away on the defensive. So a quick solution, a quick shift is an I statement. I feel upset when you, because you are responsible for your own emotions, right? I feel upset when you do dot, dot, dot. So it's just a practical switch. If I say you and I tend to attack and criticize, how do I switch that to I? A, sol a, a simple solution, and I'll give you a quick example for it. So um, you have every right to being, bring a complaint up or a concern up to your spouse. A criticism, however, attacks character, and so those are very different things, but we often blend them together. And so bringing up a complaint, you say, Am I allowed? I'm not, didn't think I was supposed to complain as a Christian. Are we allowed to complain? Let me give you a practical example, and you tell me if you think we're allowed to complain. If I went and bought a T-shirt from Vasquez, at the mall, and I got home that night, and there was a hole in it, what am I probably going to do? I'm going to bring it back the next day. I'm going to go to customer service, Trevor, and I'm going to hand it to them, and we say, there's a hole in this sweater that I just purchased. And if they respond with, well, how do I know you didn't do that in the 12 hours that you had it? All right, what, what is that probably going to do to my insides? I'm going to have a little fight or flight mode. <laughs> I'm going to get a little defensive. And if they say, well, where's the receipt? And if you're like me, you lost the receipt in 12 hours and you're digging through your purse and you have every receipt from Weiss from three months ago, but you don't have that receipt from 12 hours ago and you're sitting there and you can't find it. What am I going to do? I'm not going to shop there. I'm telling my friends, you, are, you will not believe the experience I had. And I'm going to tell them not to shop there either. Now, I purchased a sofa a couple of years ago. I'm not going to tell you where I purchased it from. It was a Black Friday sale, and it was a really great deal. I had a budget for it, and I ordered it, and it was supposed to come in in two months. Now, as it was getting closer, I was supposed to be getting updates. So I was calling, oh, it's on its way. Everything's fine. Okay, it's December, okay, and January rolls around, and I'm like, where's my sofa? I'm literally sitting on blankets on the floor. You've been in that season? Just me? No, come on, you've been in that season. Pop-up chairs? All right, I hear you. So I had a blanket on my floor until my sofa was arriving. And, you know, it gets, it feels long, you know. <laughs> 24 hours feels long when you get a blanket on the floor. And so what I, I kept calling. And you know what I found out? 
the day after you ordered it on Black Friday, the sofa, the type of sofa you ordered was in a warehouse, and the warehouse actually was, like, was set on fire. Like, the warehouse burned down. The day after you ordered it, I'm not, this, guys, true story. The, and you can ask, as a school-based therapist at Conrad Weiser, and every day I was going in, these secretaries were getting updates from me as to where my sofa was, what was happening, what wasn't happening. The warehouse burned down people, which means there was no sofa for four months on its way. And as this, like, finally came to light, I'm sitting there with the owner. I'm like, sir, we have the situation on our hands, don't we? He's like, like ma'am, yes, we do. And, uh, well, Turns out there was actually a truck that had departed prior to the, melt, the literal meltdown of the facility that had three sofas left. And they said, ma'am, you are going to get the first sofa on that truck. And we are taking off a huge discount off an already discounted sofa. And they apologized. And can I tell you something? Because I was met with such great customer service, I still speak highly of their company. I still share it with others because they... They treated me so well with my complaint. I had an authentic complaint. Come on, there was room for me to complain. There was some injustice that occurred, but because they received the complaint so well, I was able not just to continue to shop there, but get other people to still shop there too. So when you go to your spouse with a criticism versus a complaint, a complaint may sound like this. What if you came to your spouse and said, I'm feeling... I'm feeling really overwhelmed when I'm the only one putting in the housework, and I, I really need your help in this. Like, I, I know you've been overwhelmed too, but this is getting too big of a burden. What if you were met, in, now versus going to somebody with a criticism, you don't do anything around here, you never get anything done. Come on, this sounds way too familiar <laughs> for all of us. And what would happen if that was a shift to, I'm, I'm really, st- I, I'm overwhelmed, I need extra help with that. Now, if you got defensive like that store, first store owner with the t-shirt, like, well, it's your fault anyway. If you would get up earlier, you know, you're lazy. If you would just put your own dishes, like if you would, if you would, that's deflecting, right? Defensiveness. But instead, what if you were your spouse's best customer service? Oh my gosh, I didn't know you felt that way. I didn't realize that I wasn't doing that. Just like that store owner took ownership over the area that they needed to and made an adjustment. What if we were each other's best customer services? I didn't know that that was happening. I didn't realize, and then all of a sudden, what are we doing? We're meeting each other's needs in a deeper way. So criticism, a uh, complaint over criticism. A criticism moves towards battle. Defenses come up, and you're playing offense and defense. A small solution would be inviting someone into an eye, a place of vulnerability and intimacy. And I'm not saying things will flesh out perfectly because two people are playing the, the same, you know, having a, a same role in conversation. But these are setups for God to begin to bless, restore. they are small shifts that you can make to create space for the Holy Spirit to begin to work in ways that you can't on your own. Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft word turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. And when you begin with that soft word, when you begin with an I statement over a you statement, it gives the Holy Spirit move to begin to convict. He didn't ask you to be the one to push them towards conviction, but to leave space for him to do that. And then the second one is contempt. And this is verbal abuse. This is implying your partner is inferior. It may look like name calling, sarcasm, sneering, like belittling. This looks and sounds ugly. Now, if there's contempt, the solution to this is to banned it from your communication entirely. The solution is this is something that we cannot tolerate in our conversation. And if one person is willing to do that and somebody else isn't, this is where we need to put up a healthy boundary in our life. It may sound like I love you, but you can't talk to me that way. It may sound like I love you, but we can't talk right now. Like we need to resume this when you're when we're both able to speak to each other respectfully. Then if you missed our boundaries conversation, you may need to go back and revisit that one. I think it was about two weeks ago that we talked about healthy boundaries in our relationships. Ephesians 14, 15, says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every, in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So the idea is speaking truth in love. Sometimes we got to bring some stuff to our spouse that's unjust, right? I had to tell them that the sofa, this is not okay, but we can do so in a way that's loving and not attacking somebody's character and identity. And the third is defensiveness. We already talked a little bit about that, that if you're working from an insecure place, you may be defensive. You can't even receive healthy feedback because you're so fearful of not being good enough anyway. Any type of adjustment, any type of criticism, your walls may go up because it's affirming your worst fear that you aren't enough, and so you can't even hear clearly the feedback. Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. The solution is to accept responsibility for some of the problem. If you notice you struggle with defensiveness, 
And maybe that's your band-aid. That's your band-aid to cover up the fact that you don't feel worthy, you don't feel good enough. So you're just defensive because it's so terrifying for you to think that you may have fallen short because it may confirm that worst fear the enemy's been telling you, that you suck as a human being, you're not enough, and you're not worth love in your life. And so if you move towards defensiveness, one small step towards victory in this area is to begin to take some ownership. I'm sorry I had that tone with you. You know, I apologize That's, that it made you feel that way. You know, I had no idea. Or if I could have done it differently, I would have. You know, I apologize, I was working out of the flesh, and I'm going to ask God, and I'm going to get accountability for that in my life. So that's number three. And then number four, as far as negative modes of communication, Dr. Gottman calls it stonewalling. See, when there's tension, it can lead to what we call flooding, right, that fight or flight. And if you move towards flight, what ends up happening is you stop giving your usual clues of listening, you aren't really able to show empathy the way like you typically can. You begin to block all stimuli. And in an attempt to recover from flooding, you shut down. You may shut down to any hope of resolving the conflict. Sometimes you'll see this dance in a couple. An argument takes place. Maybe a man feels flooded. And so he moves towards stonewalling and he leaves the home. And the woman feels abandoned. And so now she's struggling with, you don't care enough to stick around and work it out. And he's literally saying, Fis, I just can't. I can't. So you hear someone say, I can't, I just can't. What are they saying? I'm overwhelmed, I'm over flooded. And so a healthy solution to this, Galatians talks about one of the fruit of the spirit is self-control. And so one of the ways that we can navigate this is how do I self-regulate and help that other person understand what I'm going through so that they're not feeling abandoned. It may look like a plan. You know, when this dance happens, let's plan for taking half hour space and we're going to revisit this tomorrow. It puts an end time on for her so she's not feeling abandoned and it gives him space to regulate and her self to regulate. So we're kicking out of that tunnel vision and we're actually able to have a productive conversation. If you're tracking, say I'm tracking. <laughs> All right, I hope so. If not, you can see me throughout the week. You got my email. When someone's flooded, it's important to say, what is my plan? And just building, again, that self-awareness around that. So here we go. The Ziggurat effect, moving on beyond those four, those are some effectual strategies. I want to tell you about this real quick because this is going to sum everything up. This refers to when we have better recall for events that we have not yet completed than for those that we have. So if you feel resolution in an area, you're able to forget it. Set it and forget it. I don't know if that's even relevant. The idea is, you know, you can just forget it and move forward. However, if you have un something unresolved, it comes to the forefront of your mind. We see this when we talk about, like, trauma brain. If you've gone through a trauma and you've never fully worked that out in your life, when you have a perceived threat, you react as though that trauma is happening right now, even though it happened 10 years ago, because your brain is still trying to self-protect. So if you've gone through trauma and it hasn't been resolved, you will respond to a present-day uh, you will respond to a small stimulus as though it's a present-day issue that you're bringing 10 years into the present. Does that make sense? When you see somebody respond, you're like, they're having a panic attack, but everything's fine, seemingly. What is going on? They're having a physical response to a past uh, a past trauma, it, their body is trying to gear up. It's like if you eat, if you ever have uh, ate something and you got food poisoning and it was your favorite food, now you can't touch the stuff. What's happening? Your brain is conditioning you to say this was bad for you then, so stay away from it now. I had bad sushi the day before I went to see uh, Lisa Harper speak, and I had and it was the day before I preached too, friends. And you didn't even know. Your girl was up all night because I had such bad food poisoning. I was so dehydrated. I felt like crap. And I, I loved sushi. And even now, I'm just, didn't I just have my first sushi in like a year and a half because it was so bad? I'm not going to tell you where I got it. You can see me after because we're all not. <laughs> Some of you know. You know where I got it. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, you know, our bodies have a way of self-protecting. So the ziggurat effect is essentially saying you have better recall for things that are unresolved in your life. And so biblically, what does God call us to do? He says to own responsibility and ask for forgiveness from that partner. And then it's so begin with confession. Sit down with that person. Don't let a conflict go unresolved. Sit down and both confess. Own up what you need to own up to. And then move towards extending forgiveness towards one another, and it moves towards a deeper understanding of each other that actually leads to a stronger, more enduring relationship. Now you say, Pastor Sarah, that sounds great, but there's two people involved, and that sounds way more simple said than done. You're absolutely right, and that's why we cannot negate the impact of bringing the Holy Spirit in. 
Because if you do not bring the Holy Spirit in, you're really just setting yourself up to try harder. And we know trying harder in the flesh doesn't work. Not to mention, that's why we talk about it's so important to be equally yoked to your partner. You want to go into marriage saying we are building our house on the foundation of God's word. We're God honoring. If you're living together right now and you're not honoring God, then begin to honor God. Begin to sleep separately. Begin to say, God, we're going to live holy and we're going to trust you with our relationship. And we're going to ask, we're going to invite you into this process. And so that's why it's so important if you're dating someone who's not saved, then you are already saying, I'm going in unequally yoked, saying the Holy Spirit is going to be able to influence me, but I'm going to have to work so hard in this relationship because I'm working with someone who's only working out of the flesh, not being able to work out of God's love. And so I will also say to you, if you are in a marriage and you got saved and the other person is not saved, live a holy life. Be an example and pray for your spouse because your, your model, your witness can win your spouse to the kingdom of heaven. And for those who are professing Christians in a relationship with somebody who's not and act like it's completely fine, then you have to wonder, are they born again believers? Because if you're born again, it changes everything and you should be battling for your spouse's salvation. If you believe that God has a plan and a purpose and to build his kingdom, there is no such thing as that type of relationship and being steady or, or, or healthy in that place. And so if you can confess uh, ask for forgiveness, extend forgiveness, that person might be like, whoa, what is going on in this place? And remember, forgiveness is a heart posture. It's not necessarily, you know, not, uh, it's not necessarily access. And what I mean by access is just because you forgive someone doesn't mean you give them full access to your life. You know, you don't want to, if someone has, you know, if they're irresponsible with a level two access in your life, then that's where you reduce your access. You reduce your access to your life to level one. If you give someone level 10 access to your mind, your body, your heart, your soul, all of it, but it, they, their responsibility, they have shown that they are not able to manage that well, then you need to reduce your access in their access in your life. And so the healthy bet, forgiveness is not access. And I have to make that distinction because some of you are just being doormats in a relationship, enabling somebody to continue bad behavior. And so here's your couple steps that you can write down for conflict resolution skills, all right? Are you ready? We, we're going to do it. Can, are you guys still chill that we can just get this? Get this? Okay, I want to get this to you, so we're going to go there. Number one, start with the right setting. Start with the right setting. I know don't let the sun go down on your anger, but at night, I'm not thinking clear. Are you? I'll go to bed, and I'll say my life is just all these horrible things. I can't deal. You know, you go to bed just with this, this disastrous mindset. I hate the world. I hate my life. I hate me. Right? It's just like you hate everything. And you wake up, and you're like, wow, that 20% shift, it's like everything's right back on its axis. I can deal with this. You ever have? <laughs> Come on. That can't just be me. You go to bed, and everything feels like the worst case scenario. You wake up, and all of a sudden, it's just like a little, you see it different. So some of you are trying to work everything out at night, and it's actually escalating. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And so there's a time and a place to say, you know what? This is important. We'll deal with this tomorrow, but let's just like say a prayer and say, you know what, at the end of the day, we love each other. We, we're going to work this out. We trust God with this, and, and we forgive each other, but we're, we are going to talk about this, and we are going to address some things. So to start with the right setting. Choose an intentional time. Perhaps you, you, know, you get the kids somewhere, no interruptions, things like that. Number two, begin with the conversation with affirmation. Statistically, uh, conversation tone doesn't rise above the level of the first three minutes. If you can keep it chill for three minutes, you're going to ride out that conversation in a healthier way. If it rises from the first three minutes, you're probably going to be yelling for a really long time. So you want to be able to like start with affirmation. And Proverbs 15 says, a soft answer turns away wrath, confront in a loving, positive manner. I love you. I'd like to talk to you. I'm upset versus you made me mad. Someone's on the defense and all of a sudden we've exploded within the first 30 seconds. Okay. Number three, communicate your complaints versus your feelings. I'll give you this real quick. Do it without fixed judgments and interpretations because oftentimes we're going in with a narrative and a story we've already created. So Im implement active listening skills in your relationship. I hear you saying that you don't care. Then give that person an opportunity to say, yes, that's exactly what I meant, or no. And if they say no, you have to believe them in good faith and give them the opportunity to try again. You understand? So I hear you saying that you didn't care enough, so that's why you did that. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. Or no, what I'm saying, I was tired and I was exhausted, so I never got to it and I forgot you had told me. Then you have to believe them, so then try again. Okay, I hear you saying that you were overwhelmed. Is that true? Yes, then we can move forward. See, active listening. We come in with a narrative and a story, and then we're just proving to them that they suck and they care. And then here's the thing. Your spouse can eat a cracker. They can't eat an elephant. 
So when you globalize everything and say, well, you never do this, well, I can't tackle a you never problem. But if you say you didn't take out the trash, I can adjust to that. Your spouse can eat a cracker, they can't eat an owl elephant. Stop giving them elephants. Remove globalizing from your conversations and implement, uh, from, move from globalizing to specific things. Cracker, not elephant. Track? Yes? Okay. 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love is not rude, it does not demand its own way, it is not irritable, and it keeps no record of wrongs. And then the fourth piece is to forgive and release. Don't allow the devil a foothold in your relationship because over time, unresolved conflict will open the door to give the enemy a foothold in your life. I had a cool illustration, but we're out of time. So I'm going to uh, pray over us. Worship can come back out. We're going to take up our missions collection here. And um, I just want to highlight a cool full th- a few things about our missions collection. But we're also, we're going to use this time. We're going to pray, pray over what God's speaking to your heart. We'll take up our missions collection. I'll let you guys get out. I know the young adult life group is getting started. Sorry, Trevor, I see you. (laughs) All right. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time together today, Lord. Thank you for walking us into a greater awareness, Father. And where we are aware, God, we can do something about it. But Lord, I feel like you're even speaking that the places that we're not aware, that when we invite you into those places, God, that you'll do a brand new work in us. And so right now, Jesus, we invite you into those spaces. We invite you into the places that hurt. We invite you into past relationships that were dysfunctional. We repent, Lord, of our part. We repent of living on according to your word. And in this moment, God, we declare a brand new beginning, not in our own strength, God, but by your power when we invite you in those places. And so we do that right now, God. We invite you into the unseen places of our hearts, the unseen places of our minds. Lord, the places of our hearts that we've lived unsubmitted, God, would you deal with that part of us right now in Jesus' name? Would you not let it go unattended? We don't want the enemy to have a foothold. We've been trying to walk out relationships, God, but we've been doing it, leaving a door open to the enemy to create havoc, and we wonder why you're not blessing our relationships, God. But Father, you're asking us to shut the door so that you can bless, because you will only bless which will heal us. You will not bless what will break us. So we repent of those doors in Jesus' name. We shut them right now by your grace. And we invite the Holy Spirit to empower us to brand new living. We turn away from the things of this world and we look into your glorious face, God, where we are transformed and made new. Church, would you just recall to mind those you have to forgive right now? The Holy Spirit wants to do a work in your heart. He wants to do a work in your mind. He wants to free you. He wants to heal you. He heals the brokenhearted, the word says, and he binds up their wounds. Lord, would you bind up our hearts right now? Father, we love you. We commit our relationships to you. Help us walk in a holy way of living. Help us honor you and glorify you in all that we say and all that we do. You know, with heads still bowed and eyes closed, if everything I just prayed and you're saying, Pastor Sarah, that's me. I receive it. Just put up a hand as your confession of saying, God, I'm receiving what you're doing. Amen. I see all those hands. Hallelujah. I see all those hands. God sees your hands more importantly, and he is already doing a new work in you. He's already moving in that relationship in ways that you couldn't possibly do in your own strength. He's beginning to cast new vision. He's beginning to take off things that would hinder, and he's beginning to breathe life into areas just through your act of obedience and surrender. Lord, we receive we receive this gift now, and we're going to start thanking you for it even before we see it in our natural eyes. We're thanking you for the restoration. We're thanking you for your strength. We're thanking you for your power. We're thanking you for your healing hand, God. We're going to walk in what you are already doing and preparing for us. In Jesus' good and mighty and matchless name, we said together, amen, and let it be. Amen, let it be. Come on, let's celebrate God's goodness in our lives. I want you to thank him this week. Before you see it in the natural, begin to thank him. All right, as we close in this song, we'll take up our missions collection. And I just want to celebrate something with you. Our 
goal for the month of January was $200. And we came in with 342 for our missions in January. And our kids ministry brought in $21, friends. Our kiddos are learning the gift of giving. And we're so grateful for our 0 to 12-year-olds and their generosity as they learn to give sacrificially unto the Lord. We're giving to Save One Ministry. They sent us a card and said, thank you for signing up for monthly giving. See, our giving allows them to do what they're doing. They go where our hands can't reach. Our kiddos are giving to a compassion child. We're giving to Freedom and Restoration for Everyone Enslaved, a Berks County Coalition to help women come out of sex trafficking and a home of hope here locally. And we're giving to a missionary, cover planning, a missionary couple planting a church in the Middle East. And we're going to have them with us soon. I'm so excited for that. So let's just pray over this offering and we will close today. Father, thank you that we get to give. Thank you that this will go where our arms can't physically reach. But Father, we ask that you would send your spirit into these different ministries and continue the good work that you're doing. By your blood, God, continue to heal, continue to free, continue to restore, God. Continue to do what only you can do. Would you multiply this offering like you did the fish and the loaves? God, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. today, Lord. We thank you that you are good and that you are on the throne and that you have it all under your precious palm. So we leave it there, God. We give it to you and we don't pick it back up. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, thank you for joining us as we concluded our Building Healthy Relationship series. You're not going to want to miss next week when we start our brand new series as we lead up to Easter. We'll see you then.